Hello. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Sweet. Okay. Let's do this. So, uh, my name is Jenny Zhang. I'm a front end engineer and Drupal engineer living in Toronto right now. Um, I've been a developer for just under three years. Before I was doing that, I was uh, an accountant. Um, here's a lesson I spent $50,000 in four years learning. So there's something in economics called sunk costs, and it's basically the idea that when you're making a decision, the amount of time or energy, money or energy that you've already put into the decision is irrelevant, because you're never gonna get that time or money or energy back anyway, no matter what you do. Um, it's, pretty much what mean, it's pretty much what people mean when they say don't throw bad, uh, good money after the bad. And um, I'm really, really bad at dealing with sunk costs. So Twitter has that feature where they let you download your entire Twitter archive from since you signed up, um, I got mine recently just for shits and giggles, and it turns out I signed up for Twitter in October of 2007, about a month after I started, started university with um, the Queen's School of Business. Um, my second ever tweet was about how much I hated my economics class. <laughs> my tenth ever tweet, four days later, was about how much I hated my accounting class, and then another four days later there were a lot of capital letters and censor swearing <laughs> about uh, how much I hated my entire program. And you'd think that would be a clue, right? Um, it turns out I'm not very observant because I graduated from Queens in October of 2011. Uh, a lot of things changed in two, between 2007 and 2011. Um, for one, six months after my business school education started, the economy went to hell in a handbasket. Um, entire web ecosystems rose and fell in that time. Instagram and Pinterest did not exist, to say nothing of Snapchat or Vine or Yik Yak or Whisper or Secret and what have you. Um, emojis did not come pre-installed on your phone. And there were only two installments of Halo, the good ones, <laughs> might I add. Um, the one thing that did not change was how much I hated being a commerce student. Um, and my sincere apologies to everyone who followed me on Twitter during that time. Um, as much as miserable as I was in my business school program, it never would have even occurred to me to drop out or transfer. I wish I'd known Wolliver back then, because that would have been useful. <laughs> Um, I mean, it was Queens, and it was the Queen School of Business, so in my, in my mind, I was like, it's prestigious, it's fancy, we have a castle in England, and if that doesn't say delusions of grandeur, I don't know what does, right? It seemed like a very tantalizing world, but I didn't actually realize it was a world I didn't want to belong to. So, um, once I'd spent a year in the program, and then two, and then three, well, at that point, I'd had so much invested, I couldn't possibly give it up. I became a TA for my third year accounting class, even though my accounting final made me cry in first year. Um, I joined some accounting society thing, the internal audit committee, and uh, if there's a more boring three word phrase in the English language, I haven't come across it yet. So instead of cutting my losses and running, I doubled down. And there's that thing people say where, you know, sure you're selling at a loss, but you'll make it up on volume. That's not actually how things work. <laughs> so I graduated in the fall of 2011 and I moved to Toronto, job offer in hand, and irrationally optimistic about everything. Because I was good at being an auditor, right? I got really good performance reviews in my internships, and I was good at checking receipts and making sure people weren't lying about how much money they spent. And even in a recession, you need someone to count your money to tell you how much you were losing. So it's guaranteed job security, and what more could you want? And it never really occurred to me that just because you're good at something doesn't mean it's actually the right path for you. I'd spend four years and $50,000 to put a BCom after my name and to get a job offer from one of the big four accounting firms. And these costs were so sunk, they might as well be a luxury ocean liner, right? <laughs> as stubborn as I am, <laughs> as stubborn as I am, I actually made that myself, I just wanted to point that out. As stubborn as I am, worn down from four years of hating my program and going straight into hating my job, um, even I could see that another three years as an auditor might literally kill me so I took a detour. So I've been making websites since I was about nine years old. Um, Sailor Moon fan sites, Harry Potter web rings, life journal layouts, life journal used to be a thing, it's like Tumblr except fewer gifts. Um, I went from notepad to front page to Dreamweaver and then back to notepad. Uh, I made flash based layouts because everybody makes mistakes. Um, I, learned P <laughs> I learned PHP because WordPress didn't have the features I wanted out of the box and I learned, learned JavaScript because frankly I'm a magpie and I like making shiny things zoom around the screen. Um, but it wasn't, so I've been doing this all my life, and it wasn't until I attended WordCamp 2011, um, a WordPress conference in Toronto, and then also started volunteering with Ladies Learning Code, that I realized that all those bits and pieces of web development knowledge I'd picked up over the years as a hobby were actually things people wanted to pay me for. So I knew enough, like, 
irrationally, I knew enough if not to make a good living, then at least escape the terrible one that I had signed up to do. So seven months after I moved to Toronto to become an auditor, I quit my job, and I got my first ever web development gig as the solo developer for a small boutique ad agency. And that's kind of unheard of, right? Like, business is an industry with rules. If nothing else, it's full of rules. You pay your dues, you do three years in the field, you get a CA, and then you can do the thing that you actually wanted to do, which would be like consulting or financial analysis or something equally exciting. Um, sometimes people left the industry because they couldn't pass the exams for whatever reason. Nobody quits before their three years are up to go do something completely unrelated like web development. Probably because those people are smart enough not to do accounting in the first place, <laughs> but that's not the point. Um, so I talked a good game about you know flipping off the establishment and following your dreams and going your own way and all that stuff, but I was terrified of giving up my education and training all of that to do a job that I didn't have a day of actual experience for. So imagine my surprise when I got to my job and I started working and it turns out I actually do have a lot of experience for this. Business school, the classes that I didn't skip, um, actually did teach me a lot of what I needed to know about being a developer. Not the technical components, not how to code, um, but how to work, basically. So here's a bunch of things I didn't realize I was learning in business school. I mean, why pay $80,000 for an MBA when you can listen to me for 15 minutes? So here's point number one. Faking it till you make it actually works. So Julie spent a lot of time talking about this this morning, so I'm not gonna harp on it. Um, but here's the story. There's a, you know what's really terrifying is when you're 18 years old and you're at a company's recruiting info session and you're trying to impress cool people from various companies and you barely have any idea what they're talking about. Um, what's almost as terrifying is when you're 22 and you're at a recruiting info session and you're talking to 18 year olds and you realize, holy shit, these people are looking up to me. What the hell? I still have no idea what I'm doing and they think I'm an adult. That's not okay. Um, during my brief, during my brief stint in accounting, I actually went back to Queens to recruit because apparently I'm very sadistic. Um, and so that put me on the other side of that recruiting dynamic. And I still feel like I had no business being there, I, just as I did four years ago. But then I realized I only had to pretend to be confident, right? Like, I was talking about my own experiences and how I got this job, which is something I knew and could talk about. And if I felt like I was gonna throw up, well, I could do that later in private. Um, <laughs> See, when you pretend like you're someone who believes in themselves, it gradually becomes a habit. Just as mechanically smiling when you're in a bad mood actually makes you feel better, um, eventually you forget that you're only pretending to believe in yourself. And an important thing to remember also is don't compare your insides to other people's outsides. You know yourself intricately well, right? We're all type A personalities, very nit nitpicky. You know all of your insecurities and neuroses and anxieties and all of that stuff, but what you see of other people is only their exterior shell their Facebook feed, for example. Um, just because someone else looks like they know what they're doing doesn't mean they actually do. They, they're probably looking at you wondering, how the hell do you have your shit so together when I'm a complete mess? Um, I'm not saying pretend you know something when you don't actually know the thing, that's what asking questions is for, but this is about having the confidence to actually put yourself ask, out there and ask those questions. Uh, which brings me to my second point, which is everyone has an area of expertise. And this also means that everyone has something you can learn from whether or not you know it. Uh, when you train in something highly technical like computer science or like accounting, um, everybody who doesn't have that specialized knowledge seems like they're just a little bit not with it. It's very easy to get tunnel vision and forget that not everyone goes to the same training you do. I mean, what do you mean you don't know how to write a recursive function? It's the easiest thing in the world. Uh, it's not, first of all. And uh, even if it were, even if the thing that you're discussing seems like it's the easiest thing in the world to you, remember a project that's never just functions and variables and source lines of code and all of that stuff. It's the project manager and the product manager and DevOps and clients and account executives and UI people and designers and all of those things and everybody contributes something different. So the person down in account management might not like barely know how to right click on an Excel spreadsheet, but what they can do is pick up a phone call and charm the client and uh, save your butt when you go over budget, as you inevitably do. Um, so don't discount that. The most important thing to remember is to talk to everybody on their own turf. If you're frustrated with someone um, working in a different field than you are, remember they're not trying to irritate you actively, right? They just have different goals and probably speak a different language than you do. Um, so use the magic words, just so I understand you, what you're saying is, and invite them to share their expertise so you can learn from them. Plus, the little bonus incentive is, 
people really like people who ask them questions. People really like feeling helpful and knowledgeable and useful, because we're basically all narcissists at heart. And when you ask someone questions and you invite them to share their expertise, um, they like you, and that's really important when you're in the work field. So for example, if you think someone has a cool job, ask them if you can take them out for coffee and learn a little bit more about what they do. Or if you like the way someone on your team or um, in your class programs, ask them if they can sit, you down, sit down with you for a code review or do some pair programming. And before you know it, that's how you get mentors, by asking these questions. Um, obviously, it goes without saying that do the same for other people when the opportunity arises for you. Um, when I said that everyone has an area of expertise that includes you and reciprocity, our innate urge to return favors is very useful. Um, as Neil Gaiman said, you can pick two. You can be on time, nice, or good. And you only have to have two of those things for people to want to work with you. And if you're nice, that gives you a little more, bit more wriggle room when you make mistakes. Um, which brings me to number three, being wrong is not a weakness. The most interesting thing I learned in, psych in business school were in, about psychology from my marketing class, which makes sense because marketing is the class where they teach you how to manipulate people. Um, <laughs> One of those things that you learn is that people tend to actually trust you more when you admit that you're wrong. Um, the obvious reason for this is that when you admit you're wrong, admit, uh, admit responsibility, people think they're transparent and they're, you know, they will tell me the truth and maybe they screwed it up this time, but next time you know, they will do a better job or they know how to fix it. Um, the slightly less obvious reason why people tend to trust you more is that when you're wrong and you apologize and you take responsibility for the thing that went wrong, it sends the message that you are aware and in control of the situation. And they've actually shown this in studies. So a company that says um, their terrible sales last year were due to management screw-ups is viewed more positively than a company that says their terrible sales last year were due to um, a declining economy. Uh, because if people think if, you know, if you're in control of what went wrong, you'll also be able to control the solution to the thing. So when you're apologizing, focus on that, what steps you're gonna to take to control the situation. So from the programming perspective, it's a pretty easy parallel to see. I mean, if you make a mistake in your version control and your program breaks, what's more reassuring? I checked out a file from the wrong branch, my bad, let me fix it. Or there was some sort of merge conflict, I'm not really sure what happened. Like, sending the message that you're in control is very important. Um, and also remember, experience is the name for the thing that you get if you don't get what you want. You can learn from your mistakes, and mistakes are not bad things. They're not, it's not bad to admit weakness. Um, and this brings me to my next point. How you learn can be as important as what you learn, which includes who you learn from. There's a thing in business school called, called the case method. It's pretty simple. Um, the instructor gives you a real life scenario of an organization or a company in crisis, and it's up to you to come to the solution to that problem. So, your lifestyle brand struggling with marketing, or your pharmaceutical company that has to decide whether or not what to invest in, or your technology company um, deciding whether or not to enter a new product market. If you were the CEO, what would you do in that situation and why? Um, the method is used at Harvey and Ivy and business schools around the world, and it's a really good way to learn to pull the relevant facts out of a very complex situation and come to a quick decision use real world scenarios like this because they're messy and imperfect and no problem you encounter in the real world is going to be cleanly designed and wrapped up with a little bow. And the programming equivalent of that is looking at other people's code. Um, find someone who's had the same problem you have or a similar problem and see how they approach and architect it. I'm not saying follow what they did exactly because other people's success stories, we often forget, is only a history of how they got there. It's not necessarily a roadmap for how you can accomplish a similar thing. Plus, maybe they're a terrible developer and you don't want to do what they did. Uh, you don't know, right? But other than being thrown in the deep end and being forced to write a 100,000 line app you know, from scratch, there's really no better way to learn than to look at a variety of code that a variety of people have written under a variety of different circumstances. So obviously everybody, I assume, knows about Stack Overflow, the programmer's best friend. Um, but what people might not know about is that there's the code review stack exchange and that's where you can look at completed code that people have written and submitted and see feedback from other people about how that code could have been better written. So my point is, don't reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. In addition to learning from your own mistakes, learn from other people's mistakes so you don't make those mistakes in the first place, right? And that's because your time and resources um, are finite. In addition to sunk costs, there's another concept in, in economics called opportunity costs. 
the explicit cost of going to school is the tuition you have to pay. The opportunity cost is what else you could have done in that time, like getting a full-time job. Um, everything you do, every single thing you do has opportunity costs. The opportunity cost, for example, of playing Dragon Age is a social life. <laughs> so that means for every feature you add to your program, there's features you have to eliminate and other corners you have to cut. There's only so much time and energy and money and whatever available to you. Cheap, fast, and good. When you're programming in a real world scenario where there's finite resources, um, sometimes you can pick two of those things, often you can only pick one. And there's also a finite amount of attention that the end user can give to your program. If you put in too many options and too many features, too many cooks, if you will, that can be hostile to the end user as well. And this concept applies also outside of programming in the environment you work in. If you're a freelancer, the amount of time you spend optimizing your server or billing clients is time you're not spending programming. Think about what your core skills are and outsource the things that are not central to what you do. There's no point in you struggling with an invoice when you can pay someone else to do it with for you. And there's even opportunity costs taken on other, uh, taking on clients, which means other clients. Not every client is created equal, and some clients are awful. Um, maybe what you do isn't exactly what a client. Uh, what, maybe what you do isn't a good fit for what the client wants to do. And if you take them on because you know you are not good at turning down clients, for example, it's a very difficult skill. Um, it'll just end up being frustrating for both of you. Or maybe the way they communicate uh, drives you up a wall, and uh, if you take them on, you, you're gonna start dreading work and avoiding and procrastinating because you don't wanna deal with them, and that ends up being a really toxic relationship that poisons your entire work environment. Um, you're not gonna have a whole lot of choice necessarily when you're starting out in terms of clients or programming architecture, uh, but the more you learn to optimize these choices, the less heartbreak will be in the long run. Um, <laughs> Which brings me to my next point. Your failure to plan does not constitute my emergency. <laughs> Has anyone here worked in like retail type environments? Um, I'm sure this will sound familiar to you. Someone comes in at 8.30, half an hour before the store closes, and says, I absolutely need this very particular obscure 18th century book with a blue cover, or I need to get 15 calendars printed before tomorrow, or I need you know, a, a giant catering order. It's an absolute emergency. And this is the thing that I could never say to them because I didn't want to get fired, but their failure to plan does not constitute my emergency. See, successful businesses always have a business plan, right? They know where their revenue is coming from. They know what clients they want to target. Um, they know where they want to grow. And most importantly, they pretty much know, have a good idea of where their pitfalls are before they start, both external threats and internal weaknesses. And the way to transition from that into programming is to spend as much time or as much uh, as possible as much time on design as on implementation. Slow down and look ahead instead of just focusing only on what's right in front of your face um, so that you're not just solving the immediate problem that's facing you right at this moment and then making it more complicated for yourself later down in the line. Uh, skate to where the puck is going, as Wayne Gretzky said, because business schools like sports metaphors. I'm not really sure why. Um, <laughs> What this might mean is designing programs in such a way as to minimize maintenance costs, right? Like it might be easier to hard code something today, but you know, what if you have to change it six months from now? And worse, what if the person who has to maintain your code is you? Um, <laughs> be the future you's best friend, right? Don't make it more complicated for yourself when you're looking at your code a year later and going, I have no idea what I meant. Um, this also means having a plan in place to deal with technical debt because no system is perfect. At some point, the design flaws of a system is gonna catch up with you and you should figure out how you're gonna manage those things on your own schedule before something breaks and you're putting out fires. Because just, some, just because something is important and in your face right now doesn't mean it's the best use of your time or even an important thing to be dealing with. So avoid having your schedule dictated by hot fixes and emergencies and all of that stuff by planning ahead. On the other hand, you don't wanna plan too much because you can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Planning and designing is something that I can occasionally be brain crack. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of that term, but it basically means you get so carried away dreaming and imagining and thinking of all the optimal, amazing ways you can solve a problem that you never actually start. There's a concept called the 80-20 rule or the uh, Pareto principle, which basically means that 20% of the effects come from 80% uh, of the effects, sorry, come from 20% of the causes. So what this means is 80% uh, of your revenue might come from 20% of your customers, or 80% of your crashes are gonna come from 20% of your bugs. The inverse of, that, the inverse of that means that once you've achieved the initial 80%, what's going to be probably your minimum viable product, any additional improvements you make over that 80% uh, is going to cost a lot more resources comparatively. 
So get that 80% down fast and solid. Um, don't optimize too early because you're gonna get caught up in snarls before you even see the big picture. And then after you've done that, after you have a solid foundation to work from, then size up the opportunity costs of additional features and um, decide how you're gonna iterate. Your program doesn't have to be perfect. You may not, you know, you may not even decide to iterate later on. It doesn't have to be all things to all people. A very important thing, a very important strategy in deciding and helping you decide where to go with the additional 20% um, is knowing why you're doing the thing. You should be able to summarize the big picture of your project or organization in under a minute, you know, an elevator pitch. Uh, if you can't easily summarize what you're doing in under a minute, chances are you don't really know what direction you're going in or why, and that's not really a good thing. Um, I used to think that mission statements and vision statements and whatever were super wishy-washy business jargon that don't actually mean anything. Um, I still mostly think that, but a well-crafted mission statement can also be really useful in guiding you. Um, a, a, a vision is kind of the blue sky ideal of what you would like your company program project to be, and a mission statement is how you're gonna get there. So for example, um, Amazon's vision is to be the Earth's most uh, customer-centric company, and Google's mission is to organize the world's information. That's pretty straightforward, and it doesn't get into any of the nitty gritty about how Amazon has Prime and Kindle and Instant Video and blah, 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 blah. Um, but the point of having a long-term goal like this that you can easily summarize and keep in your mind is that when you're making a decision, you can then look at it and go, does this move me away or toward the goal? Um, and a good thing to keep in mind when you're making that decision is to think about the benefits and not the features, right? So an office buys a copy machine not because it needs copies, but because, uh, sorry, an office buys a copy machine because it needs copies, not because it wants a copy machine specifically. Um, think about what problems you're solving instead of coming up with specific traits, right? Maybe a user thinks they want a mahogany table with uh, six marble legs, but what they actually need is just a flat surface to put food on. Um, while you're having those conversations and trying to figure out your overall purpose and mission, uh, document, document, document. You already know as developers and software engineers and whatnot that documentation is your best friend. Um, but this also applies to things that you're doing around the programming when you're talking to clients and you know, when you're talking to product managers and all that stuff. Uh, when you have meetings, follow up with an email summarizing everything you've discussed because you, first of all, you come off as super organized and competent, which is awesome. Um, but it also gives you a chance to make sure that everybody's on the same page and to correct misconceptions. Um, there's even psychological benefits because studies have shown that people commit better and are much more likely to follow through with things they've written down. Plus, it's really good to have something covering your ass. If there's scope later on or if people disagree on what you decided, you can point to the paper trail and said, we discussed this in this meeting. Uh, I'm not doing that feature that you want me to do because that wasn't part of the original scope. Um, and finally, and I'm cringing a little bit, that I'm gonna say this because it sounds super douchey, but <laughs> you're the product you're selling, right? Your main resource is your time, you're selling the use of that time to employers and clients, and it helps a lot to think of yourself as a business unit. So for example, think about strategic differentiation. Why do some people go to Second Cup and why do some people go to Starbucks, right? How are you different from everyone else in your field? It doesn't have to be some like grand philosophical thing or anything, it could just be, you know, maybe you're really good at ping pong and people like having good ping pong players on their team. Um, but it's important that it's there and that you know what it is. Um, think about comparative advantage. What are you better and more efficient at than other people? And what are other people better and more efficient at it than you are? Can you team up together to maximize your efficiency? Um, think of yourself as a one-person factory of code. Where are the bottlenecks in your operations? Do you have trouble starting or following through or finishing? Or does research take a disproportionate amount of your time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Identify the, the failure points effectively um, and figure out how to, how to improve them. And also think about how you're investing your time. What projects are going to have the greatest long-term return? You know, maybe one project pays more now, but it doesn't have any growth potential, and another project doesn't pay a whole lot right now, but you get more learning opportunities. What risks are you then taking on by committing to a longer-term project instead of taking cash now? Um, my point is, you are just a microcosm of the larger work structure that you're in, and if you think about the system as a whole, both in terms of organization and workflow, um, I help, like, I find it really helps me distance a little bit more from my long-term goals and look at my skills um, and my learning objectives more objectively. Um, so that's it. Those are the 10 most important things I think will help in your professional life. Uh, ironically, the company I work for now, at least half of our engineers don't, didn't study computer science. We've got people from 
marketing and politics and anthropology and economics and me accounting. Um, and it's kind of nice seeing how different people from different disciplines approach solving the same problem and talking things through. Because diversity in thought is always a good thing. You know, who knows where the next world changing idea is going to come from. Um, so I'd love to hear from you. You can find me on Twitter and feel free to send me an email or grab me after this or tonight's social. If there's any questions, I'm happy to field them. Thank you to QSEC for inviting me.